Myths of the Dog Man by David Gordon White Chapter 4 Visvamitra and the Dog Cookers As we have noted in the previous chapters, a recurring theme in the Western mythology of the monstrous races was their Indian location. This tradition of the monsters and wonders of the East began with the Greek historians Theseus and Megasthenes, who confused mythology with anthology. Indeed, the epic Mahabharata is spangled with references to Cyclops, Sayapoda, the Pinoti, as well as to Blemies, Cynocephaly, and other zoocephalic hybrids. As such, it may well have been a, or the source of, Tesius and Megasthenes' confusion. In India itself, however, such fanciful creatures were never given the attention they came to receive in the West, nor did traditions concerning them take on a life of their own. India did, however, have categories of its own to which it was most attentive, categories according to which all of humanity, as well as a number of troubling hybrids, were classified. One social or antisocial group within or outside of the Indian classification system were the Svapakas or Svapekas, the dog cookers, dog milkers, or dog people. This group will be the focus of the following two chapters. In the Sudravarga section of the 6th century lexicon, the Amarakosa, we find in immediate succession lists of synonyms for outcasts, hunters, and dogs. The first of these lists is entitled, The Ten Names for Candalas. The Candala bore the generic sense of outcast in India from the time of the Vedas, 12th to 10th century BC. In this list, we find the following names. Plavas, floaters. Matangas, elephants, or matriarchates. The Nisadas, Svapakas, the dog cookers. Antivasis, dwellers of the ends. Pulkasas, Bedas, the sundered ones. Kuratas, Sabaras, corpse men, Polindas, and Malechas, the babblers. This list may be divided into three categories. The first, composed of those names for which no translation is given above. The Nisadas, Pulkasas, Kuratas, and Polindas are tribal or ethnic names that the Sanskrit tradition of the Amarakosa probably took piecemeal from the people's names for themselves. The second category, the Antivasis and the Bedas, are people defined by their exclusion. In this case, from the society of the four proper castes. Other such designations, not found in this list, include the Nervasita Sutras, expelled sudras or unabidable sudras, antiyajas, last born or lowest born, antiyavasayans, people of the lowest station or final remainder, bahyas, outsiders, and avarnijas, people without caste. The third category is that in which reference is made to what these people do. Plavas float, malechas babble, matangas presumably deal with the elephants, Savaras, or Sabaras, dispose of the bodies and personal effects of criminals or persons without family ties, and Svapakas cook dogs. It is this last member of the third category, especially inasmuch as it is juxtaposed to lists of hunters and dogs, that will be the focus of our attention throughout the next two chapters. In fact, the term Svapaka is, like Candela, and more than any other of the names given in the Amarakosa, a general term for all of the outcast peoples of India. We may therefore deduce that the outcasts are in part defined by a particular relationship that they bear with the dog. There are very few references to dog-headed humans, Svamukas, in the Indian traditions, and it is rather these outcasts whose relationship to the dog is of another stripe, that will concern us in this chapter. There is, nonetheless, a connection between these Indian peoples and the Indian Sinocephaly, most graphically described in Tesius and Pliny. 
Here we are referring to the race called Sinamolgai, or dog milkers, in the Western sources. In the Sanskrit of the Indian traditions, a variant rendering of the term Svapaka is Svapeka. While the two are considered to be synonymous compounds of the word dog with derivatives of the word pak to cook, the second term may also be glossed as svapeka, from the root pe to nourish or suckle. In this reading of the term, the svapekas would thus be a race or people nourished by dogs, suckled by dogs, or even children of the dogs. This reading is supported by the fact that there are absolutely no mythic references to these people ever cooking dogs. Svapeka may thus be a synonym of Sinamolgai. Whatever the case, the outcasts of India were so closely identified with the dog that we find, in scattered sources, statements to the effect that among the animals, the dog is the candela. As outcasts of their respective races, the dog and the Svapaka were nearly interchangeable elements in the ideology and symbol system of post-Vedic India. Here too, milking is important. As we will show, the animal with which the priestly Brahmin was most closely identified was the cow, as provider of the five purest substances known to the Hindus. The Pankagavaya, composed of milk, yogurt, clarified butter, dung, and urine. The cow epitomized Brahmin purity. More than this, it was from the cow that the Brahmin obtained the major part of his vegetarian diet. Because milk and its byproducts are cooked inside the cow, they are eminently suited to ingestion by the pure Brahmin. In this perspective, the two poles of Indian society, the wholly pure Brahmins and the wholly impure Svapakas or Svapekas, are contrasted in terms of their diet. Brahmins live by the cooked milk of their pure cows, while outcasts live by the flesh or milk of their impure dogs. The danger of mixing the two is a leitmotiv in Hindu sources, in which a dog's or outcast's contact with a sacrificial vessel containing a milk product is an abomination for which ritual expiations must be observed by the pure Brahmin sacrificer. With few exceptions, India's dogman tribes or races were located within geographical India and were thus persons who lived within or interacted with Indian society, even as they were ideologically excluded from or marginal to it. Their lot was, and remains, most similar to that of the European wild men and villains. Like these, they constituted an another within, but were rarely qualified as actually being sinocephalic. As with the European traditions, India located its dog-headed men outside of its geographical borders. 1. Indian Tropics of Discourse Before we discuss particular accounts of India's monstrous others, both within and outside of its borders, we ought to look first at the place of myth in the Hindu tradition and the place of caste in the social ideology of India. A pervasive trope in Hindu mythology is the use of accounts of familial, social, or cosmic crises as means to teach or reiterate a basic worldview and ethos. Because the Indian tropics of discourse are so different from those we have reviewed in the West, a brief comparison of the two traditions is in order here. As fanciful as Christian hagiography might appear, it nevertheless maintains a certain concern for the historical element or perspective. This is to be expected in a religious tradition in which the universe rides upon an arrow of time whose flight is of finite duration. In the Western context, this flight, this divinely ordained linear history, ends with a division of the saved from the damned for all eternity. But the strong determinists bent in the Judeo-Christian history of salvation cannot compare with the post-Upanishadic Hindu worldview. In this tradition, all of history has already been played out from the start, and the start has itself been played an infinite number of times as well, since time is cyclical and circular. There are more important differences. Eternity, as opposed to time, only occurs at the end of time in the historical faiths. In India, time is encompassed, indeed engulfed, and rendered inconsequential by eternity. 
On the level of temporality, of existence, an individual's karma, the fruits of his or her acts as these are suffered or enjoyed in successive rebirths, is to a great extent determined by one's adherence, in past and present lives, to one's particular social and caste function. This is, of course, Krishna's teaching to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. Humans must grapple with their self-allotted karma in existence in order that God might play out his vast game on the eternal level. Rather than revolting, man is to offer his travail with devotion to God whose grace will free him. On a social level, a well-tempered balance of functions between the various classes, types, or colors of society is necessary to the furthering of the divine plan of creation. An imbalance provoked, for example, by Kshatriya warriors who usurp the functions, practices, and powers of Brahmin priests, may bring on a corrective dissolution and the destruction of the human race. The Great War of India's and the world's greatest epic, the Mahabharata, is one case of such a cosmic readjustment. The events that take place on Earth are a reflection of, and a catalyst to, events that occur in heaven. But the divine sphere, too, is subject to the laws of karma. More than this, the gods are as helpless as humans before the destiny of the universe, which is to turn relentlessly onward and to complete like a water wheel circle after circle of cosmic return. Therefore, in spite of various mystical or technical ways out of this impersonal and endless pulsing oscillation, in the end, there is no end. The system is all that really is. It is in this vertiginously vast context that the Hindu myths and socio-political realities we will discuss in this and the next chapter are cast. With regard to the place of dogmen as the Indian other within, the myths are seemingly repetitive, a kaleidoscope of variations. But, in fact, each restatement of the never-ending story adds or reshuffles elements of the whole, and in so doing, offers a new perspective on a totality that resonates on so many diverse yet interconnected levels. A most comprehensive account of the lot of the Svapaka or Svapika, the native Indian dog cooker or dog milker, is found in the post-2nd century AD didactic portion of the Mahabharata. Here, Yudhisthira asks the slowly dying Bhisma the way in which a king ought to rule in times when all living on earth has become dasufied, slave-like, and when time has arrived at a low point. In answer to his question, Bhisma relates to him the story of Visvamitra in the village of the dog cookers. Once, at the twilight of the Treta and Dvapara ages, and according to the ordinances of the Deva, there came to pass a terrible drought of twelve years' duration. It was the approach of the end of an age, and the thousand-eyed Indra sent no rain. Agriculture and herding had fallen into neglect, and buying and selling had ceased. Associations and assemblies were dissolved, and the great festivals had completely disappeared. The earth was heaped up with bones and skeletons, with creatures and men in great confusion crying, Alas! Alas! The greatest cities were deserted, and towns and houses burnt down. Cows, sheep, and water buffalo fought one another for food. The twice-born were slain, and their princely protectors laid low. In that dangerous time in which Dharma had wasted away, those who were dying, afflicted with hunger, ate one another. The seers, having forsaken their rules of conduct, left their divine fires unattended, and left their hermitages behind. Under these circumstances, the venerable seer, Visvamitra, homeless and hungry, wandered about. One day, he chanced upon a settlement of Zvapakas, those injurers and killers of living creatures, who were living in a certain forest. The settlement was scattered with broken pots, spread with heaps of dog hides, and piled with the bones and skulls of swine and asses. The clothing of the dead and garlands that had been stripped from them lay strewn about. Their hut temples were hung with iron bells and surrounded by packs of dogs. The great sage Visvamitra, overcome by hunger, entered that place. But in his begging, he found nothing at all to eat neither meat, nor grain, nor fruit, 
nor any other food, and thinking, oh, what misery has befallen me, he fell to the ground. The Mooney saw in the house of a candela a broad piece of stringy meat from a dog that had been slain with a spear that very day. He then thought to himself, there is truly no other available way to save my life at this point. In times of distress, theft from one's equal or inferior is permissible. Theft is not a sin when that which is taken belongs to outcasts. I shall, therefore, take that food. Having made up his mind, Visvamitra fell asleep. Then, seeing that it was the dead of night, and that all was asleep in the candela dwelling, Visvamitra slowly rose and went into the candela hut. There, an ugly, phlegmy-eyed candela, who had been lying as if he were asleep, said with a broken, rough, and cracked voice, Who is pawing at my stringy meat? While the candela settlement is asleep, I am awake, and not sleeping. Away with you! Such were his cruel words. The sage quickly answered, I am Visvamitra. The candela, hearing the words of that great seer whose soul had been purified, tripped out of his bed and drew himself to his feet. With tears welling up in his eyes, and hands folded in great respect, he said to Visvamitra, O Brahmin, what is it that you wish to accomplish in the night? Visvamitra then said to the Mantanga, in emollient tones, I am starved at my last gasp. I shall take that dog's hindquarters. My vital breaths are leaving me, and hunger is destroying my memory. Therefore, aware of my Svadharma, I shall take that dog's hindquarters. The Dharma of famine is one that corrupts, so I shall take that dog's hindquarters. Fire, Agni, is the mouth and priest of the gods, and therefore pure and clean. Just as he, that Brahmin, is an eater of everything, in the same way will, eating this dog's hindquarters, be righteous in my case. Having heard him, the Candela said, O great sage, hear my words. The wise say that the dog is the vilest of all game. Of the body, the vilest portion is indeed the broad hindquarters. The act you have resolved upon, particularly the taking of that which is proper to candlehood, of that which is not to be eaten, is a perversion. O sage, seek another means by which to stay alive. O great Muni, let not the desire for meat ruin your austerities. You should know that this path is a forbidden one. The dharma of the intermingling of castes ought not to be practiced. Do not allow yourself, you who are the greatest knower of dharma, to be sundered from dharma. So addressed, Visvamitra, afflicted with hunger, responded once again, Life is better than death. One should follow one's dharma in life. I am alive and desirous of food. I shall indeed eat food. The Svapaka spoke, I really do not dare give it to you, nor can I allow my own food to be taken. We, too, would both be stained with our innate pollution for that, if I were the giver and you, O twice-born, the receiver. Visvamitra spoke, After today, when I have performed the sinful act, I shall lead an exceedingly pure life. Possessed of cleansed soul, I shall hasten back to the righteous path. Speak truly, O guru, is this a pure or defiling act? The Svapaka spoke, one must be true to oneself in matters of this world. You know what stain lies in this. He who would consider dog meat to be proper food would, I think, find nothing repugnant in this world. Having spoken to Visvamitra, the Matanga fell silent. Possessed of consummate understanding, Visvamitra then took the dog's hindquarters. The great Muni clung to the five-limbed dog in order that he might survive. Together with his wife, the great Muni ritually prepared it. Then he went into the forest. At that very moment, Indra sent rain. Revived, all creatures and plants came to life. And the great Visvamitra, with all stain burned away by long austerities, attained the highest and most wondrous of powers. Bhisma then summarized, Thus one who is expert and high-souled and a knower of solutions should, through every possible means, elevate his low-spirited self. Applying one's intellect, one should always strive for survival. Man thereby obtains a pure life and comes to realize laudable goals. Therefore, he who is without fault and in possession of his faculties ought to maintain a firm conviction regarding dharma and a dharma in this world. 
The myth of Visvamitra in the Svapaka village is a self-consciously explicit account of a universal crisis that is both a reflection of and a catalyst for human disobedience vis-a-vis -vis the cosmic order. It is also a myth whose conclusion throws its reader or hearer out of the temporal and into the eternal focus. Moreover, this is presented as a moral teaching intended for the edification of kings on the subject of apad dharma moral order in times of calamity apad dharma is the dharma of thinking on one's feet a moral order of expediency in calamitous times the time that this myth depicts is one of both social anarchy and natural catastrophe when all living on earth has become dasyufied this is a twilight between cosmic ages or yugas, just as are the Ramayana and Mahabharata wars, and the setting, by definition, for a corrective dissolution. This leads to a literal resolution when Indra sends rain to the starving Visvamitra and a burnt out earth. The casting of a Svapaka or Svapeka is perfectly logical in this instance, since the entire universe has been reduced, as it were, to an outcast existence. Only in the upside-down world of these outsiders, where life is always hell, is there an atmosphere of business as usual. For the fall of manifest existence has done nothing more than to put the entire world on a Svapaka footing. And in these extraordinary circumstances, it is perfectly fitting that a truly ethical teaching should spring from the foul lips of such a fallen creature. So it is that a Svapaka can instruct Visvamitra that he, a twice-born, should not eat dog, the vilest of all foods. But, of course, the Svapaka has it all wrong as usual, because, living in a perpetual catastrophic state of Apad Dharma, he is unable to comprehend a special law of relativity for those particular situations in which the general law must be superseded by extraordinary behavior. As for Visvamitra, he is proven right even when he is wrong when, by ritually cooking and eating, according to Manu Smirti, the dog's hindquarters, he causes Indra to bring the social and cosmic crisis to an end. So it is that having had recourse to a startling metaphor, if not an allegorical conceit, the orthodox ideology ultimately reasserts its definitive superiority and authority by making the Svapaka wrong even when he is right, and the Rishi, Visvamitra, right even when he is wrong. In this way, the social order of existence is upheld in a narrative whose expressed purpose is to allegorize the relativity of that order. 2. Can a king become a technician of the sacred? In this myth, it is Visvamitra and no other Rishi and Indra and no other god who participate in this drama on the limits of reality and sanity. Visvamitra himself is a quite unusual specimen. He might even be qualified as the stock renegade Rishi of the Hindu tradition. Of the seven primal Indian sages, who, appearing as they do in the Rig Veda, are as old as India itself, it is Visvamitra alone who originally usurps the status of Rishi rather than being born into it. This he generally does at the expense of Vasistha, a highly orthodox rishi with whom he is constantly quarreling. The earliest instance of Visvamitra's and Vasistha's rivalry is found in the Rig Veda, in which Visvamitra, associated with an aboriginal people called the Kitakas, finds his sacrifices for Sudas ruined by Vasistha's son Sakti. In the Taitariya Samhita, Visvamitra and Jamadagni defeat Vasistha's sacrifices with superior sacrifices. In the Jaimanaya Brahmana and the Bradavata, their rivalry escalates into bloodshed, with Sudas killing Vasistha's 101 sons. The rivalry between the two rishis is escalated to a cosmic level in the Devi Bhagavata Purana where it is said that the quarrel of the two, who have taken the forms of carrion-feeding birds, is the cause for the decay of the entire cosmos. While this episodic theme is retold throughout the length and breadth of the Hindu literary tradition, the classic version of these two rishis' rivalry is in the Mahabharata. Visvamitra, 
the royal son of Gadi, becomes tired and thirsty while hunting in the wastelands. He comes to the hermitage of the Brahmin sage Vasistha, where he sees Vasistha's wish-fulfilling cow, Nandini. Visvamitra begs Vasistha to give her to him, but Vasistha refuses because without a cow, he, a Brahmin, would be unable to perform the sacrifices proper to his station. When Visvamitra attempts to wrest her from him by force, she resists. Nandini's eyes become red with fury as she produces from her anus hordes of palavas, from her excrements sabaras and sakas, from her foam yavanas, and from her urine pundras, kuratas, dramadas, simhalas, barbaras, daradas, and molechas. These excrement-born outcast hordes rout the army of Visvamitra. After his defeat, a chastened Visvamitra decides that the greatest power in the world is not that of princely dominance, but the power of Brahmin proper to the priestly caste. He then performs austerities of such intensity that he accedes to Brahminhood. This is the mythologization of what has become a post-Vedic commonplace. Visvamitra is the Kshatriya who usurps the status of Rishi, a status proper only to the Brahmin as epitomized by Vasistha. In spite of the fact that he was born a prince and was thus entitled by birth to accede only to the status of royal sage, Visvamitra becomes possessed of the powers of a divine or Brahmin sage. While he rests for himself the ascetic sage's power, he never gains the latter's sanctioned authority, which is a matter of Brahmin birth. In a sense, this struggle between Visvamitra and Vasistha mirrors the social upheavals of the 7th to 5th centuries BC, which occasioned the co-opting by princes of priestly prerogatives in manners of sacred knowledge. We find ample evidence for this in the Upanishads. The mythology of the upstart Visvamitra may be seen in this light as a repost by the priestly caste to a princely power play against its authority. This changing relationship between the two elements of the Hindu power elite is also reflected in the mythology of the Vedic and Hindu gods. Here, we see a gradual replacement of Varuna, the Vedic god who represents magical and contractual priestly authority, by Indra, the royal god of military might. In later mythology, Visvamitra becomes a double of the Kshatriya Indra, and Vasistha a double of his father, the Brahmin Varuna. And, as had been the case with Vedic Indra, so it comes to pass with Visvamitra. After losing many battles against the Brahmin orthodoxy, embodied by Varuna and Vasistha respectively, in the end Visvamitra, in his iconoclastic ethic, win the war. The myths of Visvamitra apparently sanctioned the new order represented by the heroic ascetic whose austerities endow him with the power necessary to assert his renunciate ideal over the old sacrificial ideology. Indeed, the old sacrificial order of Brahmanic Hinduism came to be the casualty of two complementary trends. In tandem with the renunciant internalization of the sacrifice first broached in the Upanishads, there emerged the new Hindu devotionalism, the religion of bhakti, in this changed spiritual environment, which uncannily arose at the same time as did the Christian gospel of love in the West, devotion to a personal god, generally the minor Vedic deities Vishnu and Shiva, was reciprocated by that god's love, protection, grace, and salvific intercession at death. The bhakti cults, which have characterized popular Hinduism down to the present day, thus generally bypass the elitist mechanism of the sacrifice and democratize Hinduism, bringing participation in the high religion within reach of nearly all classes and castes of Indian society. This new egalitarian spirit is reflected in Krishna's teaching in the Bhagavad Gita that the knower should see the cow, Brahman, and Kandala as one and the same. But here, we have leapt far ahead in the chronology of this mythologized power struggle between elites, for it is precisely the orthodoxy's ideological ammunition in response to such heterodox statements that is of primary concern to us. 3. On the Origins of the Non-Existent Fifth Caste 
a variant mythological explanation for Visvamitra's ambiguous and therefore dangerous status is indicative of the symbols that the orthodox ideology employed in its portrayal of its nemesis, the non-ruling renunciate Rajarsi. In Mahabharata, Visvamitra is said to have been born from a ball of Karu, into which his Brahmin father, Rikika, had placed the energy of the supreme Brahmin, the essence of Brahminhood. This ball of food was swallowed by a Kisatriya princess named Satyavati. Technically, this makes Visvamitra the issue of a mixing of castes, by the logic of which he would himself be an outcast by birth. If the textual tradition does not emphasize such a strong reading of this myth, it nevertheless throws Visvamitra together with outcasts whenever possible. In the classical origin of his rivalry with Vasistha, related above, Visvamitra is once again placed in contact with such peoples when they issue from Nandini's excrements, even if this is the only case in which they are not on his side. In this myth, as in that of Visvamitra in the Svapaka village, the ambiguous sage passes through a great wasteland or desert region stricken with drought. The wilderness is the place or non-place of the Svapaka. It is that undefined space which lies outside the limits of the royal capital, town, or priestly hermitage, or between two such centers. In a sense, once one is in the wilderness, according to the ideological perspective of these traditions, there is no one to meet but outcasts. None but the pariah live outside the society of either the royal town or the hermit's asrama. Therefore, none but the itinerant renouncer or the hunting or exiled king can ever come into contact with these non-people in the literature. A primal myth that brings together the wilderness motif, the origins of the outcast races, the Raja Rishi, Visvamitra, a renunciate Indra, and the symbolism of the dog is the legend of the Sunasipa. Harris Khandra, the king of Ixvacus, had 100 wives but no sons. On the advice of the sage Narada, or of Visistha in later variants, he pleads with Varuna, the god of law and order, to grant him a son. Varuna acquiesces on the condition that the son born to him be immediately sacrificed to himself. A son is born to whom the name Rohita is given. Harris Khandra withholds him from Varuna each time the god demands his due. This occurs five times over a period encompassing Rohita's youth. Before Varuna returns for a sixth time, Rohita runs away into the forest. Back in his capital, Harris Khandra suffers Varuna's punishments. This god of the waters and of binding contracts distends the king's belly with dropsy. In the forest, Rohita is approached each year over a period of five years by Indra, who has put on the guise of a wandering Brahmin ascetic. In this form, Indra counsels Rohita to live the same wandering life as he. In the sixth year of his forest exile, Rohita came upon a Brahmin named Ajigarta, who was starving in the wilderness with his wife and three sons, Sunapuka, Sunasipa, and Sunolangula, dog tail, dog penis, and dog hindquarters. Rohita offers the Brahmin 100 cows for one of his sons, who would thus replace him in his father's contractual sacrifice to Varuna. Ajigarta agrees, but refuses to give up his eldest. His wife refuses to give up her youngest. So, by process of elimination, the middle son, Sunasipa, is chosen. Varuna accepts this surrogate victim, allowing that a Brahmin is a worthy substitute for a Kisatriya victim. Harris Khandra decides to combine this sacrifice with his own anointed and royal consecration. In the sacrifice, the sacrificial priests are Visvamitra, Jamad Agni, Vasistha, and Ayasaya. None but Sunasipa's father, Ajigarta, will kill the boy. And as Ajigarta advances on him with the sacrificial knife, Sunasipa begins to sing prayers to the Vedic gods. With his last hymn, to Usas, the dawn, his three sacrificial bonds fall from his body, and Harris Khandra is loosed from his affliction of dropsy. Sunasipa himself completes Harris Khandra's sacrifice with the rapid pressing hymn which has just been revealed to him. The sacrifice completed, the sacrificial officiant Visvamitra now offers to adopt Sunasipa as the eldest of his 101 sons. 
Sunasipa accepts, reviling his father as a sudra, the lowest caste in India prior to the conclusion of this myth, when the latter tries to claim him back. Visvamitra then announces the adoption of the boy to his sons and gives Sunasipa the new name of Devarata, God-given. Of Visvamitra's 101 sons, Madhu Chanda, the middlemost, and his 50 younger brothers accept Devarata as their elder and are blessed by Visvamitra. Madhu Chanda's 50 elder brothers refuse, however, and are thus cursed by Visvamitra with the words, May your descendants obtain the ends as their lot. These brothers and their descendants became the Andras, Pulindas, and Mutibas, who live at the northern limits. Visvamitra is said to be the founder of most of the Dasyu, non-Aryan, base, outcast races. While it is highly likely that the original Sunasipa myth alluded to in the Rig Veda passages attributed to the Rishi Sunasipa was in some sense an astronomical explanation for the fact that the three stars in the tail of Ursa Minor never fall below the line of the horizon. Its reworkings in the Aitareya Brahmana and the Sankhyana Srauta Sutra transform it into an origin myth for India's outcasts or dog cookers. The lot of Visvamitra's elder sons closely resembles that of the biblical fallen races, humans who, although created perfect, were disobedient. By turning away from their creator and the norms of good society, they brought on their own punishment, which took the form of exile. In this Indian example, the same sort of insidious ideological agenda skews the story from beginning to end. It is the same ideology that informs the myth of Visvamitra in the Svapaka village, but in that myth, the dog cooker was depicted, for didactic purposes, as a noble savage, much like the abominable of Ethiopic Christian legend. 4. Curses and Counter-Curses there exists a series of uncanny and certainly calculated links between the myths of the Visvamitra cycle. These generally involve homeopathic curses and their realization. We will begin our discussion with the curse that links the Sunasipa myth with that of Visvamitra in the Svapaka village. In the Mahabharata, it is said that after Visvamitra had cursed his fifty eldest sons to Svapakahood for their refusal to accept Sunasipa, he praised Indra. This god, pleased, released Visvamitra from an earlier curse. This curse was one placed on Visvamitra by the sons of Vasistha, those killed by Sudas or by Sudas' grandson with the blessing of Visvamitra, that he would one day eat dog meat. This he in fact does, in a not uncommon epic tendency to present at least two sides to every story, in our core myth of Visvamitra in the Svapaka village. But this is only a beginning. For, as we have seen in the earliest versions of the Sunasipa legend, the fifty elder brothers of Madhuchanda are cursed, one after the other, to obtain the ends as their lot. Their refusal to accept Sunasipa as their senior causes them to be placed upon or beyond the northern end of the world. In the Ramayana version of the Sunasipa myth, Visvamitra's elder sons reject what they see as a usurpation of their primogenitor on the following terms. We regard that accepting Sunasipa to be like eating dog meat. Visvamitra curses them to suffer that very lot to be dog-eaters on the earth for a thousand years. Vasistha places a similar curse on a prince named Satya Virata, who, after having ravished a Brahmin girl, has been exiled by his father to live in the forest like a Svapaka. There, during a drought, this renegade Kasatriya kills one of Vasistha's cows to save Visvamitra's wife and son, Galava, from starvation after which he has the gall to ask Vasistha to send him to heaven. Because of this heinous sin of bovicide, Satya Virata is cursed by Vasistha to become a dog cooker in essence. Rather than merely suffering a dog cooker existence, he also changes Satya Virata's name to Trisanku, Triple Sting. This chain of curses is brought full circle, when Trisanku, after having undergone severe austerities, enlists the help of Visvamitra to elevate him to or beyond his former station. 
when Vasista's sons hear of this conspiracy of renegade Kasatrias, they curse Visvamitra that he will one day eat dog meat, which, as we have seen, he does. But Visvamitra pronounces a counter curse upon Vasista's 100 sons at this time. They are to be reborn for 700 lifetimes as the outcast race of the Mustikas. He then kills them with his irresistible tapas, yogic heat, and his curse is immediately realized. The Harivamsa version of this myth leads into a discussion of the Iksvaku Satyavarata's descendants. His son is none other than the Harris Khandra of the Sunasipa legend, at the end of which this entire cycle of curses began, quote-unquote. It is, in fact, the very popular myth of Harris Khandra, the Job of medieval India, which also closes, in a sense, the Visvamitra cycle. Here, Harris Khandra has angered Visvamitra by accepting Sunasipa as a surrogate victim for his own son, Rohita. He is then ensnared by the powerful sage into making him, Visvamitra, the Hotar, offertory priest, for his royal consecration. After Visvamitra has performed Harris Khandra's Raja Soya, he demands as a sacrificial fee the entirety of Harris Khandra's kingdom. This Harris Khandra cedes to him, but Visvamitra, still unappeased, asks for more. Harris Khandra goes to Benares with his wife, Saibia, and his son, Rohita, to seek a servile position as a means to finding the wherewithal to pay his debt to Visvamitra. He first sells his wife and son into the service of a Brahmin, and gives the money to Visvamitra, but this is still not enough. He then looks to sell himself to someone, and make his way to the terrible cremation grounds of the city. Thereupon, Dharma, having taken on Candela disguise, comes for him. This Candela is foul-smelling, ugly, rough, bearded, black-skinned, with a mass of fang-like teeth, and a pendulous belly, bile-injected eyes, and vulgar in his speech. He carries a mass of birds, is adorned with garlands taken from corpses, with a skull and a thigh bone in his hands, horrible, and surrounded by a pack of dogs. This Candela is an executioner as well as scavenger of the shrouds or blankets of the dead. Harris Khandra goes to work for this horrible version of the Dharma in disguise on the hellish cremation ground. There, while still alive, he enters into another birth and suffers 100 years in the space of one year. During this time, he falls into a dream and sees himself reborn as a Pulkasa outcast who falls into hell. There, after a day of tortures that is like 100 years, he is reborn as a carrion and vomit-eating dog. After this, he takes rebirth in a series of creatures, until he is finally reborn in his dream as himself, Harris Khandra. He then goes to heaven, but is dragged back down to hell by Yama's henchmen. There, Yama is told by Visvamitra of Harris Khandra's lot. Yama instructs Harris Khandra to return to Earth and finish out his twelve years of suffering, and has him hurled back to Earth. At this point, Harris Khandra, the king, fallen to the station of a Pulkasa, reawakens from his horrible dream. Sometime later, his wife, Saibia, brings the corpse of their son, Rohita, who had been bitten by a snake to the cremation ground. She does not recognize Harris Khandra, who has become like a Svapaka. Harris Khandra recognizes Rohita, however, and he and Saibia agree to throw themselves upon their son's pyre when it is ignited, to put an end to their sufferings. At this moment, the Kandala reveals himself to be Dharma, the deification of the moral order, and with the blessings of Visvamitra, as well as of Indra and all the gods, he elevates Harris Khandra, his wife, his restored son, and his entire city to the aerial star of Saubha. The truth of these Romanesque allegories is nothing less than an elaboration of the ideology of caste exclusion. The dogmen they describe are cardboard characters extracted from an anonymous aggregate. As with the Sinocephaly of European tradition, these Indian monsters are nearly always nameless. 
It is, moreover, likely that many of these names given to the outcasts or foreign groups are themselves pious inventions. Their importance, in any case, lies in the explanations offered for their existence. They are fallen kings and Brahmins, cast out from noble society through the curses of all-powerful rishis. We conclude this chapter by illustrating the mytho-logic of this cause-and-effect scenario. Crime? Visvamitra tries to steal Vasistha's cow, Nandini. Outcast group produced. All outcasts produced from Nandini's excrement. Visvamitra's elder sons refuse Sunasipa as their elder brother. Elder sons become founders of Udantia races through Visvamitra's curse. Visvamitra's elder sons say accepting Sunasipa would be like eating dog meat. Elder sons become Svapakas through Visvamitra's curse. Hariskandra approves of the sacrifice of Sunasipa. Hariskandra is forced by Visvamitra to become a Svapaka. Satyavarata kills Vasistha's cow to feed Visvamitra's wife and son. Satyavarata is condemned by Vasistha to become the Svapaka Trisanku. Visvamitra helps the Svapaka Trisanku to gain an atmospheric station. Vasistha's sons curse Visvamitra to eat dog flesh, which he nearly does in the Svapaka village. Vasistha's sons curse Visvamitra to eat dog flesh. Visvamitra effects a counter curse on Vasistha's sons to become dog cookers. Vasistha's sons become Mustikas.